worldliness. Worldliness. From the pronunciation of this name, you will understand what it really means. A lot of people, we are all aware of what worldliness could be in our own definition. But it's just an addition to the kind to the number to the measure of the knowledge we have already regarding to this. And I believe the Lord will teach us, will give us wisdom to discuss this. And we all be blessed in Jesus' name. Don't forget that you can stop it's a Bible study, you can stop me anytime to ask any question. Or if you want to you feel like you feel moved to contribute anything, just signify by raising up your hand. And the people that are on, on the line, you can just uh, speak out. But because there is too much noise on your side, I have to, I have to put your voice out so that I'll be able to concentrate here because of our recording. Worldliness. Worldliness could be defined as a negative human perspective towards some certain ways of life in connection with interests, ambitions fashion, passion, or affection. Worthiness is a predominant passion for obtaining the good things of life in an unusual manner. It is to be obsessed with the gains and the enjoyment of all the good things that life provides at, at the expense of God's commandment. It is to be concerned with worldly affairs to the neglect of the spiritual needs. Worldliness is to find it difficult to give up all excessive worldly desires after your new birth in Christ. In other words, worldliness is to have abnormal perspective about everything in life the same way unbelievers do. Worldliness is to dress like unbelievers, think like unbelievers, speak like unbelievers, and do Act and do act in the manner of unbelievers. When you decide, when you decided to surrender the running, the running of your life to the Lord Jesus, everything about your life was also surrendered to God through Jesus. The life you now live is not yours, but Christ's true faith, because you have been crucified with and died with. You've been crucified with and died also died also dead with Christ and therefore you are crucified with all lustful and worldly desires amen I will explain to us what I've been trying to read out and I know that we understand it in our own language but I want to define it now in a layman's language so worldliness is to have passion or interest that is abnormal about the things of life. It is not only Christian that is worldly, but in, in, this, in the language of nowadays, we believers think when we talk about worldliness, we are talking about the, the, the passion for the things of the world in the body of Christ. Unbelievers too can be worldly. So, but worldliness that we want to define to, because if you look at the definition of worldliness, you will see that worldliness is as in the church as in, in the world. So worldliness, regarding the definition that we have here, is the, an excessive passion for many things, for fashion, for things, many other things. When you have passion for things in an abnormal way, it's called worldliness. To love the things of the world at the expense of the commandment and instruction of God. That is what is called worldliness. When you find it difficult to let go some certain lifestyle or, or interest, or passion in the, for the sake of Christ. It is called worldliness. When the affairs of life means a lot to you than any other thing around you, it is called worldliness. To be worldly. To be worldly. And we'll begin to see them bit by bit. I believe that we understand the definition. Anybody here that does not understand the def definition of worldliness, you can raise your hand. I will repeat all over again. Worldliness. I will, I will repeat it. I will read it all over again. Worldliness could be defined as a negative human perspective. You know, when you have abnormal negative passion or interest for the things that the world provides, the things that the secular world provides, it could be in fashion. 
It could be interest. It could be money. It could be ambition. It could be any kind of pursuit of life. When you give excess interest, abnormal interest into them, at the expense of the commandment of God, you don't care what the word of God says about it. You don't want to know what anybody, any pastor, anybody does. All you know is that because you love that thing, you are so interested or so deep into, into that thing, you cannot let go. You enjoy it. You love it over any other thing. It is worldliness. It can be any form. It can be in, in, in your interest. Like I said, in passion, in fashion, in, in any form of loving excessively the things of the world or things that the world produces without finding out what the commandment of God says about it. Or even when you find out, you find it difficult to even you know, go the way of God, be on the side of God regarding the, those certain things. But as we continue to go, you understand the meaning more. And you see which way man can be worldly or how can you identify worldliness in our lives. We are not just teaching so that we can point at fingers at other people, but we are teaching so that we can look into our lives first and see if there's any 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 kind of worldliness in us before we begin to help others. Amen. Amen. Titus chapter 2 verse 12 says, Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present, in the present age. We should live soberly and in a godly manner in this present age. So in other words, Worldliness can be an excessive living, according to definition. Living in an excessive way, extravagant way, extraordinary way. When the Bible commands that whatever we do needs to be moderate, sober, minimal in anything we do. In, as we're going, like I said, we'll begin to see it. I don't want to jump before any, anything. Amen. Do we understand that Bible passage, Titus 2, 12? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Righteously, soberly, and godly in this present age. Brethren, as soon as you are reconciled to God through faith in Jesus Christ, His Son, you must begin to differentiate seriously the mode of your dressing while you were living in, in sin and now that you are in Christ. The way you used to talk with slangs and slogans and the way you talk now, what you used to have passion and interest for then and how you feel about those things now, do, you, do your friends, relatives, neighbors, colleagues, or schoolmates notice any changes in, your, in you after your new birth? Do you have to introduce yourself as a born-again Christian anywhere you go? Or people notice that you, are, you look like one that has been with Christ? Acts of Apostles chapter 4, verse 13. Let somebody open it. And Acts 11, 19 to 26. At 4, 13, at 11, 19 to 26. At chapter 4, verse 13. At 4, 13. You see that? He said, when the people saw Peter and the rest of them, knowing that, you know, God is a very wonderful father. God, God is a wonderful God. God is not interested. I mean, he's not interested in, in 
using a perfect vessel, but is interested in taking on perfect vessel to make it perfect to be used, to perfect it to be used. You know, these people, they, they saw Peter and the rest of them say, knowing that they were not educated. All of them they were just inside the, all the disciples of Jesus, inside that fisherman or this or that. You know, they didn't have any formal education. And when they saw, they noticed the way they spoke with intelligence, with intelligence and with eloquence. They noticed they couldn't have done that if they had not been with Jesus. Because of the way they looked like, because of the way they spoke, because of, of, of the way they, their content as well, they discovered that they have been with Jesus. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been able to do that. 11, Act 11, 19 to 26. Act 11, 19 to 26. Now, those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen tra tra traveled as far as Phoenicia. Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to no one, to no one but the Jews in uh, only twenty. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellen Hellenist, Hellenist, preaching to the Lord Jesus. Twenty-one. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned the Lord. 22. Then news of these things came to the ears of the church in, the, in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. 23. When he came and had, had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encourage them all that with that with pur purpose pur with that with purpose of heart of heart they should continue with the lord 24 for he was a good man full of the holy spirit and of faith and a great many people were added to the lord 25 then barnabas departed for thousands to see to seek Saul, 26. And when he had found him, he brought him and to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled, they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Amen. Amen. Disciples were first called. Christian in Antioch. So what we are trying to put, uh, to put out from there is that wherever these people went, it was easy for people to recognize who, what they carry in their heart, what they have in them. So in other words, their, their way of talk, their way of reasoning, and their way of look, their manner of approach to anything made everybody realize and, uh, and, and recognize the presence of God in their life. And they all noticed that they had been with Christ. Amen. Amen. And they were called the first Christian in Antioch. So from the days, although that's not where I'm going, I'm just there because we are treating worldliness. Worldliness, like our definition says, is everything that is opposing the purpose and the plan of God. Everything that opposes the, the, the standard of the Bible. Everything that, that reduces the standard of God for, for his holy place. You know, God has a kingdom. And in every kingdom, there are laws and principles that govern the kingdom. In the land, in Europe, and America, every country has their law in diverse way, and the law they form, they make it to be constitution of their nation, and this law guides the daily life of every citizen of the country, including the aliens and the visitors and whoever living in their countries. Therefore, as children of God or Christian, 
also when you are born again into the body of Christ, we God God is expecting us to begin to abide with those laws and constitution. And those laws and constitution including they include the way we look and the way we talk and the way we reason and the way we dress. Those are the things that is expected of us. So in that in that in that in that, in that case we are not supposed to say as believers, speaking in tongues, Holy Ghost speak, my faith, because we cannot show anything on the outside that proves that we have been in Christ. And every, even our character does not show that we have been with Christ. Therefore, these kind of people have decided to say, no, 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 forget about what you see. My belief is in my heart. That is what those kind of people say. Because they have disappointed people in their character, they have disappointed in their look, they are disappointed in their action and reasoning. Therefore, they hide their belief and faith in the heart. Which is not true. We'll soon get there very soon. Whether it is true, people that always say that, whether it is true or not, you'll find out. Amen. If I hold up now tomato, two tomato seeds, uh, sorry, the, uh, the fruit of tomato or apple, Let's take apple for instance. If I hold up the two apple fruits now, and one is green and one is red, and if I want to offer it for you, there was a man that used that example. And definitely, if I ask you which one you want, you will definitely pick the red one, isn't it? And you will say you don't want the green one. Why wouldn't you want the green one? Because why do you know that it's not right? And if it's not right, what do you get from something that is not right? It will be bitter. You have not tasted it, but you know immediately that the green one can never be sweet. And when you see the red apple or orange, you will say, oh, this one will be delicious. You have not even tasted it. But you saw from the outside that this is red, definitely it is good. And by the time you bite it, you will like it. So the same thing is Christianity, is Christian life. Anyone that is born again, that outside your outside cannot prove to have been with Christ, your anything you hide inside is polluted. No matter what we say, no matter what those kind of people say, my, my belief is in my heart, my salvation is hidden in me, it's a lie. They are never saved. Whatever you put on the inside, that's what you demonstrate on the outside. Because the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth does what? Speak it. The Bible also says, you must guide your heart with all diligence. Because out of it does what? Flows the issues of life. Which means, those people that believe, because any issues of their life that flow negatively, it comes from the abundance of their heart. Therefore, never believe those people that say that. Tell them to their face, you are not correct or tell them call the spade the spade you are a liar to say your faith is in your heart because it's what we see that produce what is inside of you your outside is a pro is, is a finished job of what you have in your heart so therefore if you want to if you make mistakes on the outside and say no forget about the mistakes i am born again on the inside it's not true i continue quickly <laughs> Romans 12, 1 to 2 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the masses of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that which is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. So, Renewal of our life is necessary after we have been born again. We need to def we need to separate ourselves from the world. We live in the world, but the, the Bible says we live in the world, but we are not all. We are not of the world. Our place, our our place of citizenship is in heaven. Therefore, when we are born again, the first thing to do after being baptized or even before then is to begin to renew you don't you don't need to work it yourself it's not by power it is by the spirit that comes upon you because your spirit will hate some certain things 
It is not by you trying to walk in or, or, or trying to pretend or trying to, to create this. No. As soon as you have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will hate the world. Anybody experience that kind of, you have that kind of experience? Things that you love to do before. When you have the Holy Spirit, you begin to hate it. It, it becomes your, you have another nature. Because the, the Holy Spirit you have in you is the nature of God present in your life. And that nature of God cannot cope with some certain things. And that's the reason why you begin to hate some certain things. Just call it flow naturally. It does not need your cooperation to do that. It's just natural for you to begin to hate them. If you don't feel that, that means you have not had the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit will make us hate some certain things naturally. It will make you to hate sin with passion naturally. It will make you to, in fact, you, the life without holiness will be uncomfortable. Because the spirit that lives there is a spirit of truth. Of truth. And it's the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it will help you to renew your mind. It will help you to renew your mind and you'll be a new person. That's why that book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 says, Those, those who are born again, they are what? They are new creation. All things are what? All things are passed away. And all have become new. Those who are in Christ is those who are born again. That's why I, I use that language. For them that are in Christ now, they are new creation. All things are passed away. All have become new. Amen. All have become new. That's what they call born again. New birth. New creation. New people. You cannot put old, old wine inside new bottle. Can you walk out like that? Or you use, you use a rag to patch new clothes that you just bought in the market. It cannot work out. But unfortunately, we have it in this generation. People use earring. Men, I'm talking about men. They use earring, they plant their hair. Men, not women. They plant their hair when they were in sin. And when they are born again, it does not change anything. And they say they are new people. And when you talk, they say, it's my heart that is changed. Forget about what my outside part of the body looks like. It is a lie. It's self-deception. It is the deception from the, from the throne of the devil. Deception from the throne of the devil. Worldliness, part of the definition of worldliness, worldliness we just saw here is, you know, twisting the word of God to suit your purpose. Twisting the word of God to suit your selfish interest and purpose is also worldliness. When we look at the way, at our lifestyle, when we look at our, our lifestyle and we begin to bend the word of God to go to that direction, it is a sin. It is worldliness. It is worldliness. Everything the Lord wants us to live is a life of absolute obedience. Absolute upright, uprightness. Absolute modesty. Amen. 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 No matter how much we have, we need to be modest. We need to be humble. We need, because, you know, sometimes, I remember that time when I was still in, in Africa. You know, those, those kind of clothes that they used to sew, big one, that you wear one and you put those, like, parachute one on top of yourself. Uh, uh, they call it Agbada. You know, that one, I, I was always ashamed to wear it on my only clothes when I dress. Because it makes me uncomfortable. I feel too big. You know, uh, people, I, would, I say, oh, people were looking at me as a big man. So I would be very uncomfortable. If, even in all the clothes that I had, that I had those things, I don't always wear them. I would just wear the inside one. I would take that one and hold it in the hand. So I, I, I was always ashamed to wear that one. So I would always... In fact, all, if I had those kind of clothes, the inside one you would be old, and those big ones would still be new. Because I was always ashamed to wear it. Said, ah, I look too big in this. I don't like it. So th there are some clothes, there are some dressing that, as a child of God, you will feel uncomfortable to wear. And there are some lifestyle you begin to feel uncomfortable to live. You know, when you speak to any child of God, so, I mean, in quotes, I have to be frank, a child of God, in quotes, Anybody that says I am a child of God, you said, my sister, you cannot wear this kind of ear style. You are a child of God. You say, what is wrong about it? My faith is my, that person is not a child of God. 
the person does not even have if no even if the person is a pastor or pastor misses preaching the gospel the person does not have the holy spirit i'm telling you the truth the holy spirit will do absolute it will do nothing but to keep what is in the bible it will not allow you to rest until you keep what is there holy spirit does not let you walk contrary to the bible but many fake spirits are existing now people think they are holy spirit I'm telling you, the, reason, the only way you can know the Holy Spirit is that when the Holy Spirit begins to work in you and begin to make you, because that's the job, that's what he's, he's sent to do, is to make you comply with the Word of God, to make you holy. To the Word of God, though. Amen. I'm to the Word of God. Amen. The Holy Spirit makes you, enable you and give you power to comply with the, with the life of holiness. That is what it's The Holy Spirit will not fight against anything that is in the Bible. Any child of God that fights against what is written in the Bible or twists it to suit the kind of life they want, they are worldly and they are not being correct in, their, in whatever they are doing. And the life they are living is a dangerous life. It's a dangerous life. I continue quickly. Any questions? Will you please assess your life and see if you if you if your look, attitude and lifestyle look like someone who have been with Jesus? You can never meet Jesus without a change of your lifestyle, looks and interests. If you can still find worldliness in you, that means you have not met with the real Jesus of Nazareth yet. The devil can only oppress and depress any part of your body that is not yet dead to the world. The people that have not yet met with the real Jesus of Nazareth will be running from one church to the other and one country to another looking for deliverance and healing. They will waste hard hand money on trips to get deliverance and healings, but to no avail. All the good gifts that the Lord has to offer are for those who love Him and those who obey and keep His commandments. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9. James chapter 4 verse 4 says, can somebody read it from the Bible? James 4 verse 4. James chapter 4 verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses. Mm. You adulterer and adulteress. Know ye not mm -hmm. that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? The friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world, anyone that wants to be a friend of the world, is the enemy of God. Is the enemy of God. So worldliness is worldliness is to have to be friend, to be equally yoked with the world. James chapter 4 verse 4. Worldliness in another word is to be worldly, to be equally yoked with the world. To be walking side by side with this world. To love the world with passion. To envy the world. To cherish the world. To, to, to walk every day to hear everything that the world provides is worldliness. In an excessive way. Abnormal way is worldliness. Amen. Amen. You will go to some churches you will see people using head gear, head tie to cover other people's faces. You will wonder what kind of eye ear gale is this? He cover, even to enter car when they were coming from, from, from home, to carry the gale to enter car, they, 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 will, they must have they remove it from the head and put the gale on one chair because it will be too big. It will be too, too big to be on the head in the car. So, you know, it's a very, it's a very kind of funny kind of lifestyle. Inconvenience life, frustrated life, a life under pressure. Eh? How can you be punishing yourself to, because of dressing? Some of them will be driving. They will not do neck like this because the gale is. <laughs> oh my God! You have not even started laughing yet. But by the time we get to the, by the time we get to the real part of it, you will see many pictures. Amen. Worldliness. The Lord has called us to simple life, simplicity. A simple lifestyle. A life of enjoyment. A life of peace. At this junction, I want to tell you, I, I want to sing a song and I will tell you a story. 
there's a story and there is a song. You can never, there's no way you can meet Jesus and your life will not change. If you have met Jesus and you have not changed from the old self, and you are still living in the old, in this new life, then you have not met the real Jesus, the, our own Jesus. It was when I finally met him, after much activity. You can be in the church like me, like I always tell my own stories around. You can be in the church, even worker, even anything, you, 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 will still, you are still yet to meet Jesus. Many workers have not met Jesus. Many pastors have not met Jesus. Many Sunday school teachers have not met Jesus. Many choir masters or choir members, they have not met Jesus yet. Many people running around the church, administrating churches, working in the churches, doing one thing or the other. In fact, keeping the church going, they have not met Jesus yet. I was somebody like that. When you meet Jesus, your perspective about life will change. Your talk will change. Your imagination will change. Your conversation will change. Your slang or slogans that you should take will be changed to Bible passages, Bible quotation, memory verses. Amen. Amen. Many children of God, so-called children of God, workers, Holy Ghost field, they still have the language, language of the world in their mouth. When they, when they talk, even when they write, you would think you are talking to unbelievers. A, a believer will talk and say, yes, sir. Yeah, like, like those hooligans, bandits. You know? Many kind of rubbish kind of statement. You would not, you would think, they th like I said the other time, they would sit in the, the university campus where, where they were in school. Yeah, they will, and they will carry the issues to the churches. You will see the man of God will be preaching. So he will say, hey! And the man will say, you know, they are sharing him. Sinners are hailing him. They turn the church to anywhere, any nonsense place. Depends on God. They don't even know how big the God that is in, inside the house of the children is. Have you forgotten our, our Sunday, last Sunday preaching? In the sanctuary, inside where the Ark of Covenant is, people, if you are not only complete, you cannot go inside there. The Bible says after the dedication, during the dedication, the glory of God was filled in. When Solomon was dedicating the temple, the glory of God filled the temple to the extent that the, the priest they couldn't see. Like a cloud. Everybody couldn't see. They had to stop. It was so strong and so, so, so serious. That is the kind of God they are healing people. Hey! 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 And uh, they have some, some funny looking ladies too. Hey, 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 they, leg. They, they just do rubbish and useless things in the churches. Thinking that God, they have God in, in their presence there. That uh, as if God has time for nonsense. The reason why we are teaching this is that the more holy you keep the presence of God, the more of the God, presence of God you feel in the church. And that is the reason why it is biblical to have a building as a church. It is not a sin to have a building as a church. From the days of God, God accepted it. It is the plan of God that we have a building as a church. So that the place can be solely dedicated for the service and meeting with God. Between, a meeting place between God and man. Even the place we have now will not be, because if, there are, if we have a power, there is a place, the place will be. It will be a place of fire. Because we are just using this place temporarily. It will be a place of fire that any unholy thing cannot step in. Because it will be the presence of God alone. And that is when we will see what God can do. Because the, 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 the way you present the place. Look at when Solomon, David was supposed to build the place. David was part of the planning of the building. But he didn't build it. And he provided all the material for his son to do the work while he was gone. But the planning and everything, God loved the place. He loved what they did. And his glory came down into the building. And Solomon prayed and requested for many things. If the people have committed sin, many things he requested, including some of them. If they ask for forgiveness in this place, Lord, you will look from above and forgive them. If anybody has done, you know, 
everything that's happened to anybody and they reach this place, they ask, request from heaven, Lord, you will do it. That is sanctuary, not a place of party. Not a place where they put, you know, because we are doing Mother Day, you now put Fuji at the end of the, the ceremony. Or when we do the God one, when we now finish, you now put some ging, 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 You know, they say it's gospel, and everybody begins to shake. In the church, in the place where you want God to meet you, some people mock God. And the Bible says, God is not more. Whatever a man soweth, shall he do what? Shall he read? If you, if you present your God as a God of music and dancing, he too, we, we will soon get to some stages now. Let me sing this song before I tell the story because of time. It says, when I met the Lord, when I met the Lord, it changed my heart, it changed my life, and it changed my style. That's why I know it's the Lord that lives in me. When I met the Lord, it changed my heart, it changed my life, and it changed my style. That's why I know it's the Lord that lives in me. How could you claim, oh, how could you claim to have met the Lord? testimony. When I was in the world, ah, look at the way I love to do my hair. Look at the way I, I, will, I, will, I, I will do punk, I will do, put relaxer here. And when you're not born again, you still do the same thing. That is not, it, it, that means you don't have testimony. And let me tell us, when we are worldly, yesterday, the same Saturday I was telling my wife after our evangelism when we came home, I was saying, you know the reason why people are like that? being rebellious to the word of God. Not only that they will hear it, but they will come to say, I want to attack these preachers. I want to tell them they don't have the right to do that. They will not listen, but they still want to fight you that you are preaching it. Why? Because the real people that preach the gospel that they know, they have disappointed God. They, live, they are together in whatever they do. You see one that told us that our choir master is very good and dedicated, but he is a gay. So what do you people want to preach to us? So that's kind of thing we're talking about. Worldliness, behaving in the image and the form of, of, of the world. You will not allow people to listen to the gospel anymore. That is why we need, body of Christ, we need to deal with the issue of worldliness. It's not a plain issue. It's a serious issue. If we are not taking it serious, if we are not taking this seriously, like I told my wife, I said in the next generation, we might not see people getting born again again. Because the way the church is going now with this issue of worldliness is very dangerous. It's very dangerous thing what churches are doing now. They say they are doing things to, in order to, pull, to bring the, 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 the youth to the church. That's why they are changing the mode of music, they are changing the pattern of the church, they are taking the program and everything to suit the youth. The youth that are in the world, they are carrying the God, God to the world and bringing the world into the church. And therefore, they are polluting the sanctuary fortress, according to the book of that Daniel 11, verse 32. Polluting the sanctuary fortress. The, the, the power of the sanctuary, they are polluting it. They are sending the presence of God out of the church due to their own selfish interest. It's no longer about winning souls in the church. It's about how many members, how much money we make. How much money we carry to bank every Monday morning after service? How much people we have in the service auditorium attendance? That is what matters now. It's no longer about, and that is part of worldliness. Worldliness of hitting D in the body of Christ. Let me tell us this story quickly. And as I read it, there was a man who had a building with, with 10 rooms in the, in the house. Five rooms on the upstairs and uh, five rooms downstairs. One day he had someone knocking at gently on the front door of the house. When he opened it, it was the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said quietly, please come in. The man said, please come in, the man said. He was thrilled at the 
unexpected visit of the Lord Jesus on his house. I will give you the best room in, in my house, he said to Jesus. And the room is the master room upstairs. He, pro he wanted to offer the Jesus the best room in the ten bedroom houses. And upstairs, that's the master bedroom. Well, Jesus is a gentleman. He said, thank you, and gladly accepted the invitation. The next morning, someone, someone came banging on his door. When he opened the door, when the man opened the door, guess who was there? The devil. The devil was at the door this time around. You know, Jesus occupied the, the master bedroom upstairs. Now, it was 10 bedroom house. Master bedroom, Jesus, he gave to Jesus because he loved Jesus so much. And the devil was at the door of the house. When he opened the door, the devil was there. He shouted, no, no, not you. I was not suspecting you. I don't want to see you. But the devil grinned, he smiled, and he said, I am already in anyway. And pushed the man aside and quickly ran in. There was a fight between the devil and this man because he did not want the presence of the devil in his house. Because the devil came with many filthy things into the house. Temptation, negative thoughts, sinful imagination. Everything was horrible that the devil came with into his life, into his house. By the evening, this man was able to overcome the devil in serious fight from morning the fourth to evening. He threw the devil out, of, out and closed the door. Still trying to catch his breath. You know when he finished the battle, he pushed the devil out, he was breathing. <sighs> and he remembered quickly that, ah, Jesus is obvious. I just want to explain the whole story so that I will not read it. I want to summarize it. Now, he said, ah, but Jesus is upstairs in the master bedroom. He didn't, since all these hours I've been fighting, he did not hear me or what? Or he wanted to tell me that devil is not, he didn't hear that devil was here. So, he ran to the door. He ran to the room, he knocked the door. Jesus, he will say yes. Don't you realize that I have been fighting downstairs with the devil? The devil was here. He said, yes, I know. He said, but why, do you, why are you so unconcerned? He said, because I stay where you gave me. I can only stop him in this room. I can't stop him in any other place. The man said, ah, why? He said, okay, I understand you, I understand you. Okay, now, let's share 50-50. You take five rooms upstairs, I take the five rooms downstairs. You don't say anyone we want. He said, okay. The next day, the devil came again. Knocked the door again. He opened the door, he was there again, he shouted, Ah, this man has come again. Then we quickly jumped in again. He brought many other things, they began to fight as usual. They fought and fought and fought and fought until he managed finally to push the devil out of the house and close the door behind him. Then this man went to Jesus again upstairs. He said, Jesus, but you, you said you mind only that, but I gave you all the upstairs. You didn't hear that the devil was finding me downstairs. He said, see. Let me help you quickly before you waste your time. Son, if you want me to help you, you hand me the total control of your house. Because I can only, or if you gave me all the room upstairs, I can only, devil cannot come upstairs. But you are the one that answers. I can't go beyond what you give me. Do you want to give me the 10 rooms or you want to be in charge? Do you want me to be the owner of the house why you live with me or you want me to live with you? Which one do you prefer? He said, ah, with this one the devil is doing, I think I better hang up with you. Then he, he removed the key of the house in his pocket and he gave it to Jesus and said, everything in this house belongs to you. Jesus said, yes. That is what, now you now see what will happen. And Jesus returned back to his room upstairs. There was a door the next day. Somebody knocked. In this time around, he banged on the door like hammer. And the man did not even go to the door and say, ah, it's Jesus that will open that door. Because he said, if 
I gave him the control, control of the room of the house. He will be in charge. So he didn't bother to go and open the door. And as he was thinking and afraid, because the door was continuously back, so the person was continuously banging and he was afraid. The more they banged, the more uh, scared he was. And he was now hearing the voice, I mean the leg, the steps, as if somebody was coming on the stairs. He was hearing the, st the step and he believed that that was Jesus. Maybe Jesus was going to open the door. And he was listening to them and he came out of his own room and he saw Jesus following him behind. And when Jesus opened the door, the devil shows up. And Jesus said, yes, can I help you? You know what the devil said? He said, ah, I'm sorry, sir. I think this is the wrong address. And he bowed down gently and said, okay. I have this address, I have a new occupant. And that is me. So watch the building very well and never return here. Say, yes, sir, with your highness. Igwe. And he left. He left the place. So what am I trying to tell you? Any part of your life that you hand over to God, that's what is in control of. Many Christians, they reserve some areas of their life to themselves and they give some parts to God. Those areas they kept for themselves, they are no touch areas. You can preach about anything. But if you are a child of God, that your heart skip when the preacher is preaching. Your heart is skipping. That area no touch you. That area no touch you. That area no touch you. You have a trouble. Every part of our life is supposed to be handed over to Christ. We're supposed to sit down in any under any ministration and relax. All you need to do in relation to ministration is to gain. It's not to be afraid. It's not to be fear. So don't talk about it. Ah, don't talk about that area. No. A child of God. Any area that they cannot talk about is still dark. There should be light in every corner of our life. Jesus should be the owner of the house. We should just be occupants. Somebody that is caught in with Jesus. And how can you scott with Jesus? Is by making him decide for you. Let him decide your life. Let him decide where you go. Let him decide who you marry. Let him decide where, what you eat. Let him decide where you eat. Let him decide how you go. Let him decide what you have and what you will not have. And when your life begins to do like that, you will enjoy the life to the fullest. One of the things that day I was telling my wife, I said, you see, sin. They will be, God will be telling us that he ate sin. But we will be struggling with this. Say, ah, this is punishment. I'm telling you, it's not punishment. It is that sin itself that is punishment. Holiness is not punishment. Because when God said, don't drink. If you drink, you have the trouble. In fact, your children will share from the trouble. I used to tell people, my father was, a, I'm, not, I'm not happy about it. My father was a, a, a conk drunkard. A drunkard that would drink, they would go and carry him wherever he goes, you know, bring him home. That's the kind of drunk that my father was. Sometimes he would fall, he would come with injury, you know, the body fell in the gutter and everywhere. Even he would sleep on the floor, he wouldn't know until morning sometimes. He would be looking around for him. And this affected his blood and he produced children through the blood. And the children share some disease, some sickness through those alcoholic blood. You see what I'm talking about? Until the children, the one that know how to do it, deal with it, dealt with it quickly to get out of their lives. But those that don't know how to deal with it, they are still in their sickness. So sin is poison. Sin, worldliness is poison. It's not the will of God that we should be worldly. Because we put our children's generation to come into bondage through our own sin and worldliness. We mortgage the generation that is coming that has not even come at all. In trouble. While we are long gone, my father has been long gone, some the children are suffering. And she is not the only one. Many fathers too. Many mothers too. They are long gone. Their children are, they are suffering from the generation that is taught and the fought. Even some grandfather, they are gone since the father suffered. The generation, so another one came. It, 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 it took from the sickness again. 
because of somebody's mistake. No wonder the Bible said, because of one person, sin came to be. Because of one person also, there is what? Salvation. Amen. So if we know that because of my father, sickness came to be. Because of Jesus, the sickness came. The sister will do what? Believe. Amen. Amen. So that is, that is the weapon we need to discover to be able to live a fulfilled life. Worldliness is terrible and it is, it's dangerous. Every person that is worldly, sin can never depart completely from their life. No matter how they can be. Even if they are men of God, I have seen men of God worldly. When I mean worldly, you know they cannot use some certain belt unless the belt is fashashi. They cannot use some certain shoe unless the shoe is katasoki. They cannot, you know, all those kind of things. Amen. So, that, you know, they cannot wear some suit. Do you know? Do you know there are some suits that cost from 1,500 euros? Suit. Or more. Suit. And these people cannot just wear suit unless they get that kind of one. That kind of suit. If you get so I'm, I'm telling you what I know, if you get some men of God out, the place they keep clothes is like shop where they sell clothes. Like boutique. Because the suit is just lying like that. Plenty, like they are selling. Shoes. You see plenty of shoes. I used to have a friend like that. When I got to his house, I saw shoes line up, belts, different, different, different line up, wristwatch, line up like this. And he, 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 will, he, will, he will put them as if he was selling them. He will just arrange them like this neat. The belt, the shoes, neat, the clothes. You know, he put them section by section. I said, this house is, is, is shop or what? Because it looked like shop. Everything is just decorated and placed, you know? I said, my God, what kind of woman is this? He said, yeah, I like fashion, eh? I said, yeah, I can see. Because only person that likes fashion, all oh, these things that they can open shop for some people. <laughs> there was a the time I told my wife to say, you, you better ship all this your clothes and things and go and do container. Do container and go and start shop in Africa. Because there are there are so many. So that is that is worldliness is is a spirit. It drives some people. When it enter into man, it drives you. You can even if you will not eat, you prefer to just look the way you want to look like. Amen. Amen. That's why the definition said they, they have they are obsessed with acquisition of the things of the world at the expense of even negligence of the commandment of God. They don't care what the commandment of God says. They just want to have that thing. A lot of people now they have jewelries that they bought three thousand, five thousand jewelries complete. They earn place and you know they used to send them in packet. And they have it and they cannot afford to eat regularly. So they buy them on credit installment payment. And they struggle to even take care of their children. A lot of people, if you go to many places, they have a house on mortgage, they have the chairs on, on finance, the chair in the house. First of all, the house is mortgage. The second chair is finance. Car is finance. Fridge is finance. TV is finance. Everything is, is Death, death, and death, and death, and death the whole life. They have those kind of people, they have sold the nature, the future of their children. Worldliness. I want people to see me. I've arrived. I want to be seen. I want to, you know, people respect those people that have this kind of car. Therefore, I have to get the Jeep. I have to. Worldliness. It drives people out of the presence of God. No wonder the Bible says, friendship with the world is what? Enmity with God. Anyone that loves the world to acquire things of the world, they will be enemy of God. They will walk in opposite of the plan of God for their lives. Sin is poison. Worldliness is bitter. We need to be careful. And we need to move on quickly. So please, according to the story, let God occupy all the rooms of your life. Don't begin to say, no, I want, I want to give only my heart, like we said. Some Christians, they give only their heart to God. They don't want to give their leg, they don't want to give their shoe, they don't want to give their hand, they don't want to give their head, they don't want to give their everything. Only they just occupy the upstairs, just like I read now. They gave Jesus the upstairs, and they occupy the rest. 
that's the reason why devil always have access to their lives all the time. Because Jesus is only living according to their own. They invited Jesus to only their heart, not on every other part of the land. Brethren, please take note that you cannot serve two masters and love both of them at the same time. You will definitely love one and despise the other. This is the case of many churches of these end times. They love the world so much that they cannot give nothing up for the sake of the kingdom of God. Nobody has the love of the world in him and equally loves God and heaven. A ship cannot have two captains. No woman can be married to two husbands. You need only the captain that, love God, that loves God to sail the ship of your life to heaven. If you have two captains, both captains will definitely have separate ideas and, rest and perspectives about the journey and the ship of such life will definitely sink to hell. We need to always remember that we are sojourners and exiles in this world. We must abstain from passion of the flesh which wage war against our souls first peter chapter 2 verse 11 can somebody read it first peter 2 11 a fast reader <coughs> yes yes ma'am the lord i beg you as sojourners and pilgrims Amen. So we are pilgrims in this world. You remember that that revelation I saw? I said after passing through the, the dangerous bridge, you know, it was swabbling like rope. When everybody passed through, they now welcome and say, You are welcome, pilgrims. That's the way they call Christian in that dream, in that revelation. They call all the children of God pilgrims. Amen. 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 Please, before I continue, I want to send a warning to people that will hear me on the net. And please, I want you to pass this message to everybody as far as you can. It is very urgent and it is very important. The devil has decided to do two things. Two things. And during the week, I, I told my wife about it. It was later I got better understanding through the interpretation of the Holy Spirit. To do two things. Number one is to inject people, spiritual injection, and to poison the water of life. To poison spiritual life of believers, and to inject destruction into the life of believers, which means to kill spiritual growth of all believers. Devil is trying to do that. That was done this week, done last week, God revealed that the weekend. A massive destruction of believers. I'm talking not other people, believers. He want to inject confusion into people's life. He want to inject to, to, to poison the water of life, their spiritual life, to poison it with bitterness and to destroy. And the purpose is to kill, to destroy, and to send to hell fire. And it will come with different kind of way, deception. Many deception will come. And that will begin to happen now, even before the end of this year. So if we have believers that are not gone yet, begin to encourage yourself, begin to speak to yourselves, begin to help the way you can, because the devil is doing that. And many people will be taken away with they will not even know. They will still think they are in, 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 in faith. Amen. Amen. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven will abide forever. It's me that I put my Father in heaven. They put God here. Amen. 1 John 2, 15 to 17. Anyone that does the will of God, if you keep what God says, only that you will live forever. Those people will not die. Unbelievers will die and go to grave. But if you do the will of God, your Father, everything that the Bible says, when you close your eyes, it's just like you, 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 you cross over to another place. 
and that place will be joy till eternity. It will just be bringing ahead, bringing to an end your torture and trouble in life and going to your resting place. Many people that say, may his soul rest in peace. They are not resting in any peace. Believer will not rest in, our own believer will not rest in any peace. It's not me, I'm not cursing. No matter what prayer, may his soul rest in peace. No matter whether they are small, the king, the devil, hellfire does not know small children. I used to tell my children. They don't know whether somebody is uh, 9 years or 10 years. You must just be able to keep the will of God. You must be born again. That's why when, when I'm leading children to, 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 to God, you know, it might be funny to some people. When you are asking children, they want, you want to give your life to Christ, that thing does not know age. One child begins to know left and right. <coughs> Excuse me, you need to begin to preach to them and lead them to Christ. And begin to teach them how to grow daily. They have their childish behavior, but you must speak constantly to them until they depart from this world and they will go to heaven. Heaven does not know, even if it's a child you preach to that is born again, you have a reward in heaven. So if we cannot confront the big ones, at least we target the small ones. And that's what the devil does. The devil targets children from primary school, secondary school, so that before they go far, he already finished about them. Look at the people we come across in our evangelism. Young children, lesbian, homosexuals, gay, small children, 15, 14, 16. It is heartbreaking. That is what the world has turned them into. That is what carelessness of their parents have turned them into. Some parents are so careless and worldly that they, they sell the life of their children to the world, to the devil. Carelessness, worldliness. I want to please the world. I want to please people. I want it, my. I don't want it. You know, they ask my children should come for overnight sleep na party now, slumber party. I don't want to hurt their feeling. Just let them go there and spend the two nights with them. Hey, worldliness. When they come to my children, I can hurt anybody. If you get any invitation, I will. I will disappoint you so big. If, if it's not godly, I don't care what invitation. Even my wife. I don't care what invitation is. Even if the, the man of God is, it invites my wife in a program that is not godly, to me, according to the standard of the Bible, I will not ask her to go. And I will disappoint the person. I have done it before. I say, no, that, that is not, I, I don't like it. And I will stand on it because, you know, you need to, all these things, they are the devices of the devil. And they don't come straight. When the when devil knows that you are strong in the Lord, the, his plans will not come straight to your face. They will come indirectly. And if you fall, if you fall to the small part, you will fall to the, to the big ones. And the devil knows the desires of our heart. It's according to the passion. When we have any worldliness, anyone that has any worldliness in them, they are easily deceived by the devil. Before you know it, you are gone. If we have our own things that we like, our own passion that we like, and the devil sees this, what he like is she or she is worldly, then they will be able to take the best security. Worldliness is one of the biggest weapons for the devil to take believers out of the church. Or they, they might even be going to church, but they are already working for the devil. I'm telling you, they might even be in the church, they are already working for the devil through worldliness, self-interest, self-motivated passion. Worldliness. 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 Brethren, many of the problems we face after we met Christ are from the issues of this world. Therefore, if we still live according to the pattern of the world, we cannot abstain, we cannot obtain lasting deliverance and healings cannot be divine. You could hardly differentiate between believers and unbelievers on the streets these days. Many female believers still dress like unbelievers. They wear mini and micro mini skirts that shows every of their secret areas. They wear shirts and blouses that reveal everything they have under it. They join the unbelievers in polluting the minds of many men daily with their seductive outfits. They make many men, including believers and ministers of the gospel, commit the sins of adultery of the heart on a daily basis. They make naturally good men struggle with the sins of masturbation on a daily basis. They make good young people become rapists 
when they can no longer cope with masturbation. That is what dressing have done. You know, some people when you tell them about dressing, change mode of dressing, they don't understand. That is why one of my sisters that had this kind of ministry, I used to tell her, you need to learn some certain things. Because if you put it that way straight, they will not understand you, they will fight you. But you need to let them know the consequence of this dressing. Because if you go to somebody and say, if you dress like this, you go to hellfire. You go to hell, the person will look at you and say, what is he, what is he talking about? But if you stand in the way to say, see what this dressing is causing. See what is causing. See how many people masturbate. See how many people has gone to jail for rape. Do you know that rapist people is because of what they see that they, they couldn't sleep? And they now begin to find, the devil now took over their passion and their feeling. They now begin to roam on the streets looking for whom to divorce. They turn themselves to the devil and the lion looking for whom to divorce. And as soon as they see anybody to divorce, they, they attack. From what they saw, when God created man, man was created with to have passion for what they see. When man see, they pursue. Solomon said that everything my eyes see, my heart desire. So men cre were created to pursue. Amen. And that's the reason why when they see, they become restless and helpless. And that's the reason why many people were found, they are found in, in, the, in the prison yard now. Even some people have been killed, they, they get the judgment of death as a result of rape. Because of the sin of the, the woman, some women contributed to their act. Because of way, wayward dressing, scanty dressing, seductive dressing, destructive dressing. I'm telling you, devil use of women, they do it purposely. I've seen women that do it purposely. They dress the person, ah, today they, are, they, they, will, they, will, they, will, they will take in streets. Ah, and when, when men are looking at them and going other direction with their car, they will say, ha, <laughs> zip. And they will be happy. They will be shaking and be happy. Because they have just let somebody go out of the street, out of the road for, with the car. And they will be smiling and shaking. And that's the, that's the reason why I say some people are disciple in that. They didn't know. Do you know there's a way somebody can be working with devil you will not know? Wow. Indirectly, devil has taken over. But you still think you are with God. But indirectly, devil has taken over. But you still sing to God. And the only thing you know is that you will be contributing to people falling. Contributing to people that go to hell. Contributing to disappointing and disgracing people. Contributing to destroying and pulling down. And the only way you can know is that Am I productive to the body of Christ or am I destructive? If you are not a thinker, if you are not somebody that thinks very well as a child of God, you will not know that you are gone. That's the reason why as a child of God you need a moment of sober reflection. It's part of your daily life. Like I said last Sunday, you go to your room, lie down your bed. My word, my statement, word, were they constructive or destructive? How many people have I sent out of you with the way I speak? How many people have I turned to the enemy of God with the way I speak? Am I building the kingdom? I'm destroying the kingdom. Am I like Paul? Paul got permission to go and destroy those people that are preaching nonsense. Thinking that he was working for God. Because he was defending the interests of the synagogue, the churches that existed, pre-existed before Christ. Killing the, what they call heresy, Jesus was preaching. According to them, it was heresy that the, the children, the apostles were preaching. So he got permission to destroy, to deal with them. And they didn't know that he was working for the devil. And that's why Jesus said, I am he that you persecute. I am the Jesus Christ that you are persecuting. He never believed he was persecuting Jesus. He thought maybe he was working for God. I pray tonight. In any way that the devil is trying, in any way that the devil is trying to take the children of God, you will not be among the people you will be able to, 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 to prosper over your life. He will not prosper over your life in the name of Jesus. Your life has been built upon the rock, like my sister said in the prayer prayer. The gate of hell will never be able to, 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 to prevail upon your life and destiny in the name of Jesus Christ.
You are destined to make it to heaven. You are destined to receive your crown. No part of that life will take your crown and your heaven from you. In the mighty name of Jesus. Among the people that the devil is trying to inject waywardness and backsliding. Devil want to inject many Christians with backsliding and weakness and frustration and disappointment. He will not be able to locate you. You will not get the injection of the devil. In the name of Jesus. See, you want to do something. If you drink, if you are if you are if you are living and you drink water, you need to pray. Devil is planning to pollute water. I'm telling you the secret that God will need to pollute all the water with spiritual weakness and waywardness. If you are a believer, you drink water, then you should be expecting. That kind of attack. So as from today, if you take water you want to drink, you must cover it with the blood of Jesus. Because the water comes from their source. As from today, when you want to drink water, you pray. If you want to get injection in hospital, you must pray. Because they are fighting the last battle. So as soon as anyone that drinks water, they want to set their spiritual life low and poison the spiritual life. To cause spiritual blindness. That is why you see, you can see a believer, you know, you don't understand them anymore. A believer can even be telling you Bible, and you yourself, you know, say, my, my brother, I don't understand who, the way you are twisting Bible nowadays. You are not like this now. What is the problem? They, they, they have drank water. I don't even know whether the water has already started, sir. I don't know. It's just God that just revealed it. But I don't know whether it's already started. Devil will pollute water. They have started polluting it. When you drink water, you must pray. The water we all drink, they are not covered. They just, where they are refining, they open them like this. Open. In the refinery. So therefore, you know what I'm talking about. If you, have you ever, anybody been in any refinery here? Where they, where they refine water? I've been in at least two before. So that's the way they do it. It's open place. So, and it goes through process. The water we use as the one they refine again. It's sapu. It's sapu. It's not that it's coming fresh from another place. The water that's being used coming through a river and they are refining and getting it back to the system. If you drink water, you need to be praying very well. Yes. Amen. Yes. First Peter chapter 1, verse 13 to 16. Verse 13 to 16. Is it from 13? Verse 13 to 16. Okay, first Peter chapter 1 from 13. Therefore, guide not guide not the wrongs of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the faith that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I am what? I am holy. Then how you see, you will not see brother, brothers in the Lord saying, nobody can be holy. Fellow brethren in the kingdom of God. They will just be telling other brethren, hmm, forget about it, nobody we It's just that God will give us his own perfection to make heaven. He will have mercy on us. Holiness is out of the way. They have given up. This generation have given up on holiness. They think it's, it's, it's a life that we cannot live. It is not attainable. We cannot live that kind of life. Let's forget about it. Please don't let them deceive you. Holiness is one of the things you need to do before you get to. I don't have time. I would have shown us some other Bible passages uh, uh, that I want to show. If, if you read the book of Psalm 101, and, and you, Psalm 101 tells you some of the qualities 
I, I won't take, I, I don't want to take, I don't want to deviate. Let me just continue with this. Amen. Amen. So we need to be holy as our Father in heaven is holy. Holiness inside and outside. When your heart is given to Christ, your heart will, I'm telling you, it's not, I'm not deceiving you. It's the truth. When your heart is given to Christ, genuinely, in quote, you will begin to generate what is in your heart outside. You don't need help to do that. It is automatic. Because you are changed, you have been redeemed, you have been sanctified, you have been given heart circumcision. Therefore, the heart will begin to produce the things after God. The life of the extravagant life you live before we go away. The way you talk before we disappear. I'm telling you, there are those things, there are some things that will begin to go. You don't need struggle to get out of that. No. For instance, you were an unbeliever, you were wearing chain. I thank God for my sister here. There was a time there was one here. There will be one here on the nickels around the leg. There will be one in the nose. But when the Holy Spirit comes, you say, Ah! Oh my God! What kind of nose? Behold me! Behold me with this nose in my nose! Oh my God! <laughs> you know, you begin to see yourself like, like rubbish. Say, ah! My God! Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. What is wrong with me? Look at it. He won't look at the one I put in my. You will hate yourself like passion because the Holy Spirit has come in and the body has become the temple of Christ. But if you are still a believer, in fact, you are still wearing 10 in the leg, 5 beer, 5 beer, and you put like, you know, some, some pieces they have like 4 here, around the ear. One ear, only one ear carry 4 here. Another one they will roll it around here. They will not put another one here. Christian, eh? On the on the leaf. They don't put one in the in the tongue here. I don't know how they can sing. And some of them they are choir. Some of them they will not choir master. Will not they you know the kind of hairstyle that you like a cock. You know the cock, the chicken cock. They, they, do, they do like this. They will not put it stand up like this from here to here, like a herbalist. Or all those Buddhists. The only Buddhists are not that used to do here like that, but Christian are going to it now in the church. You will see that there are people who are choir members, they are even beating drums or playing guitar. You will see the kind of hairstyle they have. In the church, with hearing men, not even women. They will do their, this ear here, they will cut it like this. They into about four with design. And they will write, they can even write Jesus in their head as a hairstyle. They will now design Jesus or cross here so that they can know they are for Jesus. This kind of design is for Jesus, it's not for the devil. You know, they will not draw star on the head here, Jesus here, uh, like crazy people in the church. And they will come, the Holy Spirit that they say they have, and when they are speaking in tongues, they speak any, in fact, they can speak tongues more than Paul. Because Paul said uh, he spoke tongues more than the other brethren. But these people, they speak, they speak more than Paul. But, but Apostle Paul. But yet, their worldliness is like the devil. They are not changed in any bit. They are not for God. Don't let them deceive you that their Christ is inside their heart. It's not there. Christ is not living. What is living in them is what they are producing outside. The thing that you see outside is what is inside the heart. No Jesus there. It's a lie. If somebody like that say, I have Jesus in my heart. I don't, don't even be deceived. Don't be deceived about what miracle. Even that person can perform miracle is a lie. God knows the reason why he does things. God does not do miracle. He does not use you for miracle because you are holy. He doesn't need holiness to do miracle. Do we understand that? God does not need my holiness to do miracle in this place. He does not work like that. He just needs to establish his plan, his purpose, and his promise. That's all. It's not holiness that produces miracle. I told us sometime when I was preaching on one Sunday, I said, the faith that you have is what produced miracle. Yeah. There was a situation that a, a 419 man, uh, I'm sorry for people that are not from part, the part of the country I came from, that will be listening to this message. They call them frosters. A froster be, was pretending to be a pastor. And from there, because he knew that this is what is giving money now, he didn't want to do fraud anymore. So, and he was not born again. So with his friend, they were four. So they said, they were just pretending to be pastors. They said, ah, Oh boy, that's the way to make money now. So they were, they, and they were doing evangelism. 
At the time of when they preached, they were just inviting people to pray. They don't know how to. They didn't know how to preach. So they were just inviting people. And before you know it, they were organizing crusade. They were organizing crusade to make money. And in one crusade, this man, unbeliever, froster. There was a, a, a woman that they brought on the wheelchair. The woman they brought the woman, and the woman was looking at the man like this, because he dressed very well, expensive suit, and all the thing was shiny, like all those heavy men of God. So and he had confidence because he had to go to Bible school to know all those kind of things, and he was not born again. And when they, when he saw the the woman on the wheelchair, he was dodging. He was dodging. He was walking away. He didn't want to go there, and the woman was doing like this. The woman was ready to walk, and he was walking away from the woman because he know he didn't have anything to heal anybody. And the woman was moving on the chair, was saying, "No, he was speaking. They didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't hear what the woman was saying." And all of a sudden, the man passed again. The woman grabbed the suit, and the woman stood up. Everybody was shouting. The man managed to control himself. When he got inside, from he stepped from the pulpit, he went inside. He was crying because he knew that he had nothing to do any miracle. He was crying. When he was crying, the voice of God just came to him. You are persecuting against me. Now, since you know how to do it in the wrong way, you need, you need to now know how to do it in the right way. Because I've seen, and God is merciful. God now saved him. He now got born again, genuinely. He was crying like baby in that room. He was crying like baby because he had the voice of God. Life. You have been persecuting and deceiving people in my name. I did that to let you know that I don't need you to do any miracle. And he fell, he was asking, what can I do, God? Have mercy on me. Forgive me, Lord. You know, those kind of people, need, they need to do a lot of restitution. They want to go and stand in front, <laughs> in front of those people that say, I was deceiver. Amen. So what I'm saying is that God does not need any compassion for anybody to do miracle. So People are always carried away. When you say they are not holy, you say, look at what, I'm, what God is doing in my ministry. Check it. The lame are walking. The deaf are hearing. Miracle. If God is not for me, what can do that? They are making a terrible mistake. Because children of God don't have reputation anymore. And God needs to let people still believe in miracle. There must be miracle. Otherwise, there will no longer be faith on earth anymore. People will no longer be born again anymore. That is why that one alone God will never cease to let it happen. In as much as there is faith from anybody that I can, when this man touched me or when I grab this man, I will stand up. I'm telling you that person will stand up. It's the faith of the person that works, not anointing. I will be lying to you to say, ah, when I walk with that anointing, the anointing just knocked down the woman. It just took, it's a lie. It's the faith of the woman that connects with my faith to make the woman walk or to make miracle happen. So we need to be getting things right. Worldliness. Worldliness. Our time is up. We need to postpone the rest till next Tuesday. Because I want to I don't want to be taking our time more than fifteen past seven before we leave here. Amen. Amen. Can I round up? Can I round up? Can I round up? We will continue the part two next Tuesday. Worthiness part two. Please, we need to be here next Tuesday. The next Tuesday is going to be more interesting than many other things to talk about, to see in the life. Please, as you are, as you are seeing it, let us pass them around. Help people. I see one of our sisters is doing that already on the Facebook, but keep on doing it. Let's help people. People that think they are doing the right thing in the wrong way, help them, and the Lord will have mercy on us in, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.